Let's pray. Father, we ask you to open the words to us of your holy book this morning. Speak through me as your microphone. Open the ears of our understanding that we might not just hear natural words, but we would hear spiritual words, for they are life. Lord, today we come to feast on the bread of the life, and we come to worship Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Praise God. This morning, I'm going to attempt to finish, I won't be done, but I will just finish uh, our series, Vision and Provision. And if we could, uh, we just remember last week I was going to preach it, and I said, I, I changed it at the last minute. You know, I said, we've got the kids program today, and we had a lot of folks here. I, I preached more of a salvation message instead. And uh, if, I, if I could have our, our house lights come up a little bit, I'm, I'm looking at darkness here. And praise God, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. That's better, much better. Thank you. But... So this week, I'm going to attempt to finish it. I won't get done, but I'll just quit at a certain time. So our series is Vision and Provision. This has been a study of stewardship, and we're talking about God had a vision. God had a vision to have a family. God had a vision to have humans created in his likeness and his image. But before God made that vision, God made provision. God made the Garden of Eden, and he put the food in it, he put the animals in it, he put all the things in it that mankind needed before he created mankind, because God gives provision for a vision. You have a vision, and I would want you to know today that you have a vision, God has provision for your vision. Now, we talked about four levels of vision. Hopefully, your vision is more than just simply eating your next meal. Hopefully, you have a vision to impact your family and your friends beyond even your own life. Hopefully, you have a vision of, of having a nice home, having a vision of having a place that's warm, of having food on your table. Hopefully, you have a vision this Christmas of your family coming together, eating together, and fellowshipping together, and telling stories, and, and playing cards or whatever you do, hopefully you have some vision. And I would want you to know today, God has a provision for your vision, and as we are part of God's vision and bringing provision for God's vision, God is part of bringing provision for our vision. Three reasons people struggle with money, number one, lack of knowledge, number two, lack of vision, number three, lack of pursuit. We've studied that, we've studied what is money, we've studied God's will for your money, We've studied four levels of vision, and we started two weeks ago the difference between a financial miracle and a financial harvest, <laughs> the difference between a miracle and a harvest, and we discovered that many people are believing God for a miracle when, in fact, God is expecting them to be working a harvest, and so just to kind of review, we reviewed, uh, or we studied four different miracles of the Bible and the process of which we studied the miracle of the manna that fell to the Israelites every day. We studied the miracle of Elijah and the ravens. We studied a miracle of the woman being fed uh, for a long time off of a jar of oil and flour that refilled itself supernaturally. We studied the miracle of a woman who was a widow and she was out of money and her sons were about to go into slavery and how God gave her a miracle of provision. <clears throat> Here are the things that I would want you to know about those miracles. Number one, in those miracles of provision, there was no harvest available. There was no uh, job. There was no ability for them to sow and reap. Those Israelites were in a desert for 40 years. They were constantly walking. They were constantly moving for 40 years. You don't have time to plant a garden in a desert in 40 years of wandering. They had the miracle of manna because there was no ability to work a harvest. The widow, there was no ability to work a harvest. The, the, uh, the other widow who, who came down to her last jar, uh, her last little bit of flour and oil, there was a famine in the land. There was no ability for her to provide for herself. See, miracles happen when there is no 
natural provision available. Okay? But even we studied, even in those miracles, they required the people who received them to operate in faith. The Israelites, see, God could have put that manna, he could have put it in their jar for them. But he did not put it in their jar, he put it outside their tent. They had to get up, he did it when? Early in the morning. They had to get up out of bed. They had to go out early in the morning. And they had to go out and gather. And if they did not gather, they did not eat. Every one of those miracles, God required the people to do something. They had to go somewhere. They had to give something. They had to use their faith. They had to work. They had to buy and sell. And that's where we'll pick up today just a couple more uh, things to study along those lines. Number one, uh, one today, the five loaves and the two fish. The miracle of provision, Jesus takes 5,000 men plus women and children. We would assume maybe that's 10,000 people. Jesus sees a hungry crowd of people. They've been following him. They went out into the wilderness. There is no McDonald's, no rallies. Once again, there's no natural provision available. They're in a wilderness. They, they followed him, and they were there three days. And Jesus looks at the disciples and says, hey, these people are hungry. Give them something to eat. And the disciples looked around, kind of like deer in headlights. We don't know what to do. <laughs> but they were at least smart enough to know we're with Jesus. And so they found out, Jesus, we have here five loaves and two fish. Now, once again, Jesus, he was the miracle worker. He could have done anything, any way, shape, or form. I mean, remember, manna from heaven just rains down from heaven. He could have rained it down on him. But he, he requires faith. He says, what? Bring it here to me. And then he has process. He tells the people, sit in groups of 50. Now, after pastoring for 24 years or being involved in churches for 24 years, I have found that pastoring people is a lot like herding cats. And if you can get people to sit in groups of 50, you have accomplished a miracle. But what is Jesus saying? We need structure and we need order. Okay? There's giving. There's structure and order. There's faith. And then those disciples, can you imagine starting to pass those fish and those loaves? They had to pass that by faith. They're thinking, we're going to get to about 12 people, and then we're going to have a riot on our hands. And buddy, that's supernatural multiplication. And then what, you know what Jesus says at the end of that? Now, gather up the leftovers. That's work. Twelve baskets left over. Our God, now, our God is a God of abundance. Our God is a God of miraculous provision. But that miraculous provision, it requires faith. It requires obedience. It requires process. See, there's a lot of people who think, I'm just going to live by faith and I'm going to just quit my job, and, and money's going to show up. That's not true. You're going to get thin real quick. Okay? The, and I, I haven't seen this so much. In, but back when I was growing up in the church, and that was when the, the charismatic movement was in its height. And, and, and man, the charismatic movement, the, the Pentecostal movement, it was, it was a great movement, but there, it had a lot of weaknesses to it. And, and people, sometimes when people get out of balance, they take Scripture out of balance they get off. And one of the ways people got off a lot when I was growing up was people would be moved. Oh, man, God's doing miracles. God's moving. God's, God's going to provide. And so they would just quit their job and then God's going to provide. And, that, and it didn't happen. And they felt, why? Well, God's let me down. No, you're stupid. Well, 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 Pastor, that's not a very nice thing. Well, the, the, I didn't say it. The Bible says it. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna read it here in a moment. You'll see. Okay. But, but you see, we got to do the principles in the Word of God. We got to do what the Bible says. Now, are there times that we need a miracle? Yes. I, I've needed some financial miracles. I've experienced some financial miracles before. Praise God, haven't you? Amen. And we're thankful for those financial miracles and those miracles of provision. The next miracle, the last one today, maybe the second to last, we'll see. <laughs> Peter comes up to Jesus. To say, Jesus, 
we got to pay our temple tax. And Jesus kind of gives a little bit of a, do you think I really ought to pay taxes to the temple? He says, they're there to worship me, you know. You think I, I ought to pay taxes? And Peter's thinking about that. Should we or should we not? And Jesus says, well, I'll tell you what. So we don't offend them. Let's pay our taxes. Now, once again, Jesus is Jesus. He's a miracle worker. He could have had the miracle happen any way he wanted. But what's he tell Peter to do? Peter, go fishing. Now, for you and I, if Jesus says go fishing, that's recreation. Okay? I've been waiting for God to say, oh, Pastor Matt, thou shalt go to Cataract Lake, fish in the Narrows, use a number six, slow retrieve, blue. I'm waiting for him to give me that word, but he, he just doesn't usually give me that kind of word. But when he tells Peter to go fish, he's actually telling Peter, go to work. Because Peter was a commercial fisherman. And he says, in the, so we think, you know, that's not what it was. It was, a, it was the nets. It was, but it's work. And so Peter takes his boat out, and he catches the fish, and he opens the first fish's mouth, and there's the coin he needed to pay taxes. Now, Jesus could have been like the, the annoying uncle guy who just, you know, at Christmas time, the kid comes up, and the uncle pulls the quarter out of the kid's ear. Here you go, Petey. He didn't do that. Why? He required Peter to do what? Faith. Work. Miracles of provision still require faith. They still require work. They require process. They require structure. They require order. And miracles of provision generally occur when there is no ability to work a harvest. That's the miracle side. So today, I'm shifting gears now to the second part of this teaching, and I want to teach you on working a harvest. Now, I know we're in the Midwest, and I also know we're in kind of a rural area that's known for farming, and that tells me that you all know how to work. You're, this is a hard-working church. We did not win 20 people to Jesus Christ the last seven days by being a lazy church. We even taught our kids to work. Those kids were here practicing. I mean, those play directors were cracking the whip, man. And we practiced, those kids practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced to be able to ring those bells. <laughs> so let's talk about a financial harvest today. Genesis 8 and 22. The word of the Lord is, as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Amen. Now, that tell, there, that, that, there's a lot you can get from that scripture. First of all, there's some doctrine there. There is some doctrine. People are very concerned about uh, what they call climate change. Okay? Now, I'm not here to comment. I'm not a scientist. I'm not going to tell you I believe in it, don't believe in it. But I will tell you this. We have God's word that we will have seasons, that we will have cold, and we will have heat. And you can trust the climate scientists if you want. I'm going to trust the one who invented science. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be responsible, those type of things. So, but as long as the earth remains, how many of y'all know? Look around. Are we still on earth? Okay, gravity's still working pretty good. No one's floating around. You're on earth. So while you're on earth, the way God does things is through sowing and reaping. The New Testament confirmation of that scripture, Galatians 6, 7, and 8, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall reap destruction. He that soweth, soweth to his spirit shall reap everlasting life. And when God takes Adam and he puts Adam in the garden that was already planted, it was already blooming, it was already luscious, it was already bountiful, but he tells Adam, he gives him a calling, you're going to work 
the garden. Tend the garden and keep it. And so even today, even though I don't necessarily buy into some of the science of today, I still buy into the fact we need to take care of the garden. We need to take care of our earth. We need to take care of our animals. Those are things we absolutely must do. I don't want to get onto too many tangents today, but I will tell you, we ought to be concerned about things like animals and those are all important things to God. And he put us in charge. And it's amazing the things that our government is in charge of, how bad. If you study how many animals have gone extinct and what the government did and how they helped those animals go extinct, it, extinct it's pretty sad. Why are you bringing that up, Pastor Matt? Because there are people in our society who want the government to control every aspect of our life. And that is so anti what God wants. And everything they touch goes to poo-poo. Now, if you work for the government, I love you. I don't mean to, I, I got off topic there. I, I apologize for that. Adam, in Genesis 2.15, God tells Adam to work the Garden of Eden, even though it was a supernatural garden, even though it was bountiful and the harvest was plenty, he says, work it, keep it, tend it, take care of it. Because our identity is in our work. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 10, and you can turn your Bible there. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 10. Brethren, that you increase more and more that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, that you may lack nothing. This is the will of God, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside. What's that mean? That you pay your bills. God is laying this out here. This is the will of God that you pay your bills, that you lack nothing. You work with your hands. You mind your own business. That's the will of God. That's working a harvest. That's sowing so that you reap. Have you ever, some of you who are on social media, maybe you've seen one of those things that says, if you share this, money will come. If you go to work, money will come is a little more accurate way of saying that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. What is that right there? Let me just, let me just make that plain. That is God saying welfare don't work. Hello. You're awfully quiet today. Did I come to the right church? I'm not against government assistance. I'm not against helping people who are down. But I am against enabling people to be in a lifetime cycle of dependence because that does not work. People, anybody can do something. Everybody can do something. Everybody can do something. And the will of God is that we work. Now, once again, I realize I'm talking to people in the Midwest who know how to work. But I'm establishing this because there are people who have grown up not realizing this, not knowing this, and they need to hear this. This is scripture. Amen. Amen. In Acts chapter 18, we even see Paul the Apostle. There were times in his life, even though he was a minister of the gospel, and even though he wrote, it is God's will that the church take care of my needs, it is God's will that the church honors the people 
who are leading the church financially. Paul wrote that. But even then, Paul, there were times he would work side jobs to help promote the gospel. Amen. That's okay. God is a God of work. God, he set the example, working six days and resting one. Now, I want to give you some scriptures. And I want, I want to give you a, just about six or seven scriptures, mostly from the book of Proverbs, that help us break down the lazy and the diligent. And to see the difference, the, these are the scriptures I have that God has put forth to help us understand that laziness is not of God. Here we go. You can follow along. You can, if you can race with your Bible, race with your Bible. Here we go. Proverbs 6, verse 10 and 11. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Proverbs 10, 4. He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent he makes rich. Proverbs 13, 4. The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. Now let's stop right there. There are still people in this world who think that any form of prosperity is not of God. It is God's will for his people to be blessed. The Israelites were blessed. They have an anointing of blessing on them. The Israel did not become a nation again until 1948. Today, Israel is a very prosperous nation. Why? Because the hand of God is on those people. You have the hand of God on you. It is the will of God for you not to be poor. It is the will of God for you to have your needs met, that you would have a warm home, clothes to wear, food to eat, and your bills paid, that you walk toward the outside, owing them nothing, lacking nothing. That is God's will for you. Amen. And so God here in these scriptures is setting up a different picture. This is what the life of a lazy person looks like. This is what the life of a diligent person looks like. And it just happens to be that laziness produces poverty. Diligence produces wealth. Now that blows a lot of people away. And sometimes we have to tell the truth because it's the truth that's going to set people free. I've done ministries of compassion for a long time. Feeding the hungry and, and doing all these things. And what I've found is in our country, are, are there legitimate needs? Yes. But there's a lot of illegitimate needs. And I found that when, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to be straight up, man. But when folks who completely blew off school and have no respect for fellow human beings, they have not mastered basic communication. They've not mastered the art of taking a shower. They've not mastered the art of pulling their pants up to a respectable height. They've not mastered the art of having a professional look. And they come in and they say, oh, pastor, where's the poor? We need help, man. And what they're really saying is, Will you give me some money so I can go out and drink and smoke and do drugs and get my next tattoo and my next piercing? Let me tell you something, young people. I love you. Are you against tattoos? Not necessarily. But if, if, if you think that your tattoos are your retirement portfolio, you're stupid. Those things are expensive. I'm tired of young people acting poor and they're covered in tattoos. You're stupid. 
Oh, I don't believe. Well, you know what your problem is? No one told you you're stupid yet. Someone needs to love you enough to tell you to quit being stupid. Amen. <laughs> Look here, Pastor. I can't afford this, but I got me a butterfly. I've lived long enough. I've seen butterflies turn into pterodactyls. I don't understand what you mean, Pastor. Look at your mom and your grandma. That pterodactyl going to look real good with stretch marks on it. It's a little butterfly. It was cute. My car don't run, but bless God, I got an $800 cell phone and a pterodactyl. Now, you say, Pastor, are you making fun of millennials? No, it's not just millennials. Man, it's their parents to help them get that way. <laughs> Giving those kids everything they want. But the way of the, talked about the lazy man, desires all day and has nothing. You ever hear someone, I've heard people talk all the time, oh, if I win the lottery, I'm going to do this. If I win the lottery, I'm going to do that. Shut up. You aren't going to win the lottery. You aren't going to win. You say, Pastor, how dare you? Let me prophesy. You are not going to win if. Oh, man, I'd buy this house. I'd buy this. I'd buy that. Really? Well, if, if you would spend time investing in the Scripture, I'm not saying God's going to give you crazy lottery money. But well, I will say this, if you sit around and think about winning the lottery all day, you're going to become poor. The Bible does tell us that. And if you give yourself to being diligent, in the same context, the Bible says you'll become wealthy. God honors hard work. Amen. And one of our things we have to be careful of as, as Christians is we are mercy-oriented, and God, thank God for mercy. And, and look, I, I came from a time, I am for government help. I'm for all those things in our, our family. I, I was on food stamps for a, a short time, or not, not food, the, the free lunch program. My mom was on food stamps at one time. We were the, the single mother that, those, those type of things, that's what it's there for. It helped us get on our feet. But during that time, my mom didn't say, I'm going to stay on this for the rest of my life. My mom said, I'm going to better myself, go to college, got some grants, got some scholarships, comes out of that thing, has a job, and had a great job and made it. It took her a few years, but she made it. That's what it's there for, to get people back up on their feet. Not to be a lifelong de of dependence. Okay? So, let's give you a few more scriptures here. I, I was going to say... Sometimes folks can allow uh, Christian folk our mercy gift and our compassion to enable people to live a, 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 a lifestyle that's not godly, to live a lazy lifestyle. And we have to be careful. And sometimes you have to be the person who says no. And sometimes even as a pastor, you have to be bold enough. And, and I said, so well, I can't believe he used the word stupid. Man, so it's sometimes, I can't believe parents haven't used the word stupid. Hey, Mom, hey, Dad, can I have a tattoo? No, that's stupid. Well, I can't believe you would say that. Well, they're 15 years old. Is there a chance their taste going to change by the time they're 19, then 20, then 30? I mean, parents, be a parent. Let's go on. A few more scriptures here. Proverbs 15, 19. The way of the lazy man is like a hedge of thorns, but the way of the upright is a highway. Proverbs 20, verse 4. The lazy man will not plow because of winter. He will beg during harvest and have nothing. Proverbs 21, 25. The desire of a lazy man kills him, 
for his hands refuse to labor. Proverbs 24, 30 and 31, I went by the field of the lazy man. It doesn't say I went by the field of the helpless. It doesn't say I went by the field of the, of the, pers- of the single mom. I went by the field of the lazy person. And a vineyard of the man devoid of understanding, and there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. Proverbs 26 and 14, as a door turns on its hinges, so does a lazy man on his bed. Proverbs 27, 23, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. And lastly, in Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, Jesus would take the two servants that multiplied and were faithful, and he would tell them, well done, good and faithful, and give them great reward. And to the servant who buried his talent and did nothing with it, he said, you wicked and lazy servant. Laziness is wicked. Listen here, church. I say that to say this. He said, why are you telling all these scriptures? Well, first of all, we need to understand stewardship. God has given you the ability to work with your hands. God has given you the ability to have careers, to have jobs, and God will come on you as you give yourself to your labor and bless the work of your hands. That is a scriptural principle in Deuteronomy 28. He will bless the work of your hands. Our primary responsibility in life when it comes to stewardship is to work a financial harvest. In most cases, provisional miracles occur when there's a lack of ability to work a harvest. The miraculous provision subsides when the ability to work a harvest comes back. The miracles when there are miracles of provision, still require faith, work, sowing, obedience, and due process. And I want to ask you in closing today, I want to ask you to be involved in God's plan of stewardship in your own personal life. I'm going to ask you to be faithful and diligent to work, to give your best to your employer. Matter of fact, I won't have time to say all these, but work diligently, work willingly, increase your aptitude, be a blessing, get it done. Some people want a full week's pay for a full day's work. Get it done. Own your work. Don't speak evil against your boss. If you don't, if you don't like your job, if you don't like your boss, have enough courage, have enough integrity, go find a different job. Don't be a little whiner. Nobody likes a whiner. Well, I just don't like my boss. I understand sometimes you need to talk about it to your spouse. You need to pray about it. You need to ask God, those type of things. But I'm talking about the person who goes to work and complains all day. Don't be that person. Manage your time. Seize opportunities. Use your faith. Sow what you want to reap. Man, if, if, you, if you were the boss, would you hire you? If you were the boss, how much would you pay you? And lastly, be a tither. Tap into God's economic plan. I want to close with a couple of scriptures, Malachi chapter 3. Go ahead and turn to Malachi 3 in your Bible. I'd like you to physically turn there. It's the last book of the Old Testament. Over the years, there's been a lot of self-proclaimed theologians who come out and say, well, you know, tithing is not this, and we don't have to tithe, and we don't have to give, and those type of things, and scriptures just don't bear that out. And uh, I want to give you Malachi chapter 3. I believe it states it the best here. 
It's all through the Bible. It's in Genesis. It all goes all the way through the New Testament. We see the tithe in the New Testament. We see giving. And I'm about to invite you today, every one of you, to be a part of God's economic system of sowing and reaping. It's Malachi chapter 3. Let's look at verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now on this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. And one of the ways God has planned, and his word, not mine, his plan, not mine, is that his people, through the process of sowing and reaping, that God would work in their lives and bring provision for our vision as we bring provision for his vision. It's that simple. And I would encourage us, and there's people that say, well, Pastor, I believe in all that. I'm just not there yet. I would encourage you as we go into 2019 to make it a faith goal to say, I may not be there yet, but we're going to get there. Brian and Becky gave a testimony. When they started really receiving this word, they could not afford to tithe. And so what they did is they came together and said, what can we afford to do? And we're going to do this, and we're going to increase it this much every month until we get to 10%. And they thought it was going to take about 18 months. And they found out when they used their faith and they began to do it, and they began to rearrange things, it was a lot sooner than 18 months that they were able to get to 10%. And after that, they were able to begin to give different offerings and how God just so multiplied their seed. We've had so many people over the years testify and say, Pastor, there was no way we could tithe. But when we began to make a commitment to God that we were going to find a way to do it, God honored our faith. And I would ask you today to consider that the process of sowing and reaping is real in your life just as much as the process of going to work for a paycheck. This is a process of taking 10% of things that come into our hands and giving it to the Lord. And it says, bring it to the storehouse, that's your church, that there may be food in my house, says the Lord. That's why we give. It also says, bring offerings. What's an offering? Anything above your tithe. Tithe is 10%. Offering is anything above your tithe. Now, before I go on, and almost, I'm almost done, but sometimes people say, well, there he goes. He's preaching on money, this, that, and the other. Listen, you spend 40 to 50 to 60 hours a week trying to acquire money. And there's many of you who started off living paycheck to paycheck. And by the grace of God, you're now living direct po deposit to direct deposit. <laughs> I'm talking about, let's get God involved in your finances. Let's get God involved in your vision. Let's get God involved and in not just living for your next meal and not just living so maybe you can retire someday. But let's get God involved in a way that makes a difference that we can give a, an inheritance, a spiritual heritage to our children and grandchildren, and that we can have a difference that's going to make waves for all of eternity. That's what I'm asking you to do. And I'm asking you as we go into 2019, as you close this year, you have your quiet times before the Lord, I'm asking you to pray as a family and to talk about this as a family and say, what would God have us to do? And you know, one thing I encourage people, don't ever wait till you get to church on Sunday to figure out how much you're going to give. That needs to be preset before you ever get here. 
Why? Because I don't ever want you thinking, well, the pastor played on my emotions to get me to give. That's not, I don't want you, if you, we, you can give, hopefully you give before you ever sit down. That's why one of the reasons why we use this offering box system. We are never, ever going to emotionally try to drive up an offering. That does not work long term. I want to make disciples. I want to teach you. These are God's biblical principles. These are, we, we serve a supernatural God who will supernaturally help you as you set your hand to say, I'm going to do the word of God. As you step out in that, God will come on you and help you. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it tells us that God will give seed for the sowing and bread for the eating. Okay? And then in that context, in the context of sowing and reaping, it says that we would always have a sufficiency for all things and every good work. That is God's will for your life. And I, as we close, I'll give you four questions. Number one, are you willing to participate in God's plan to extend his family? I've cast forth a vision for this church that in the next 18 months we want to see 400 souls come to Christ. We have a plan and a strategy to do that. We're upping our game next year with a couple big dramas. We're upping our game at Christmas next year. You saw we upped our game at Fall Fest. We believe that we have a strategy that's going to help us to do that. We're asking you to be part of the provision for that vision. Will you participate in God's plan to reach 400 souls next year? Number two, will you seek God for his financial plan for your life? Will you seek him, not just for the tithe, but seek him for how much you need to be saving. Seek him for how much you need to be spending. Seek him for wisdom. God can do in a moment what might take you 10 years otherwise. I remember one time, Andrew and I, I was so excited. Our church was having an auction. This is a long time ago. My last church, our church had an auction to help pay for the building fund. And so everybody donated stuff. And then we had an auction. And people used to ask me, Pastor, can we do that for our church? Well, I remember back then when everybody donated. Sorry, that was me. They donated their junk. But being 22 years of age, I didn't realize that I didn't have the common sense to know that people would donate things that didn't work to a church auction. I just thought everybody would give their best. And so up for auction was this ski boat, 1978 Galaxy. <laughs> and if you know me, you know I love the water and I love boats. And no one would bid on this 1978 Galaxy. And finally, they dropped the bid to $500. And before I realized, I didn't have $500, but I raised my hand anyway. <laughs> so we found $500 going once, going twice, sold for $500. I bought me a ski boat for $500. Praise God. We were so excited. We got that thing on the lake. I didn't know anything. It started up kind of halfway. It only, but then we found out it would only run in full throttle. So it put, put us out there about a oh, quarter mile into the lake, half mile into the lake, and it quits running. Okay, well, we're out there. Then it starts to sink. <laughs> and we only had a paddle that was about this long. <laughs> and I became the world champion rower. And I remember just being so heartbroken because I had visions of skiing around the lake and fishing in the afternoons and family time and uh, drowning was not one of the <laughs> part of the vision. <laughs> and I was heartbroken, man. We got that boat, we took it back home, let it drain out. I, put, I, I didn't know what to do, I just prayed and prayed. You know, I put a for sale sign on that boat. 
And someone came, and we were honest. We told him what was going on. But, you know, we gave that thing to God. We said, God, we need your help on this. this I, I wasted $500. I almost killed us all. You know, that boat we sold made $700. <laughs> I realized at that time, this buying and selling stuff isn't so bad. <laughs> and uh, God can take a disaster and turn it into a miracle. I, there was one time I used to day trade stocks before I was, when I was bivocational. When I, 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 I wouldn't do this as a, as a full-time, I'm not saying full-time pastors shouldn't do this, but it can just be too encompassing. You, you, you really get into it. But I was, when I was bivocational, I, I, I day traded, and I had some stocks that just went south. And I thought, man, uh, surely I want to make some money on these. And I didn't. I lost some money on those. Overall, we made money, but these were just some nasty stocks. All right, you take your losses, you put your Band-Aids on, and you, you cry, and then you look. You know, we were doing taxes the next year. And the accountant called and said, man, I got some bad news and this, that, and the other. And we, we were going to owe money. That just doesn't sound right. And I began to pray, God, I don't want to pay the IRS any money. <laughs> what would you have me to do? And we began to pray. And God reminded me of those two stocks that I lost money on. Oh, I can claim a loss. I called my accountant up. Hey, I lost money. I've never been so excited to lose money. <laughs> you know, we went from owing to getting a big old refund. You know, God can take your losses and turn them into gains. He really can. I say that to say, seek the Lord for your finances. Number three, will you honor and obey God's financial plan for your life? If you know the will of God, will you do it? Will you please do it? And lastly, and this comes straight from our building fund campaign, will you have joy about it? I don't, you know, God loves a cheerful giver. I don't ever want you coming, oh, bless God, I love that church, but I hate giving. If, if you hate giving, or if it's going to cause you to just, you know, completely hate everybody and hate the world and hate Pastor Matt, just don't give. But I want you to pray, not only will you obey the known will of God, but you will do it cheerfully with a willing heart with the joy of the Lord as your strength. And that's my challenge for you this year as we go into 2019. I'm asking each one of you to seek the Lord, to be part of bringing provision for the vision of being part of a miracle that next year we're believing for 400 people to find Christ as a result of the efforts of this church. That's what I'm asking you to do this year. And that, I'm not done, but I will quit. Thank you for coming this morning. We love you. I'm glad you're here. If you need prayer for anything, I'm going to have prayer partners down here on the front. Come ask for prayer. I'll see you out in the foyer. I'm going to pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you today. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Lord, we've come. We've called upon him as our Savior and our Lord. We give to you the rest of this week. We thank you for safety and protection. We thank you for favor. We thank you for meeting our needs, healing our bodies, strengthening our marriages and our families. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said, amen. We are dismissed. Hi there, I'm Pastor Matt. I just want to take this moment and say thank you so much for tuning in to the ministry of Soul Harvest Church Online. And it's a privilege to minister to you each and every time. And I just want to invite you to be a living and active part of our vision to touch the world from West Central Indiana. And if you've been blessed by our ministry, 
I would ask you to very strongly consider sowing into our ministry to provide that our ministry would continue to go deeper and wider to impact people just like you all around this world that cost the precious blood of Jesus. So I would appreciate a gift of any amount. And, and I would ask if you're on YouTube, click the link below. If you're online on our website, click a, a Give Online. Or if you're on our app, hit the Give Online tab, and it'll take you through a couple easy steps, and you'd be able to sow. And we just pray God's richest blessing on you today. Thank you. God is good. His word is true. And it works in your life, friend.